Okay, we are recording, sir. Okay. I don't know what it is, but I do remember my colleague, Mike Belandic, always sounded this way, you know. Huh. And he never, he never tried to clear his throat. And I would think, clear your throat, clear your throat. But he never did. I mean, that was his natural voice. Well, <coughs> why, don't, why don't we start from the beginning? You're a native of the Chicago area, right? Mm-hmm. Grew up here. Um, your, the ABA uh, bi biography on you says that your parents stressed education and values. And uh, Tell me a little bit about them. What, what sort of uh, foundation did they give you for life? Well, my parents were very strict, um, and times were different when I was growing up. There was um, great respect for authority. Um, there was no re-questioning of authority or, or teacher's word. We respected it as the truth. And my parents were very fussy about their three children um, adhering to that um, level of respect and and doing their homework and studying properly and doing our best is really the bottom line. And all three of us did that without, uh, without giving it a second thought. It was just the way things were. What did, what did you, you actually mm -hmm. say? In, 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 You're wrong. Yes. Okay. Well, I'm curious, what did your parents do for a living? What did they do? Well, my mother was a housewife, a homemaker. And my dad did a variety of things, but he, um, he did deal in wholesale meat business. And um, he, he, that was his primary business, really. He, you attended Catholic schools here in Chicago? I'm sorry? Did you, you, you attended Catholic schools here in Chicago? Yes, mm -hmm. all of them. All three of us attended Catholic schools here in Chicago, except my brother went to Marquette for a while, okay. into California. But, what, uh, did you have an early interest in the law, or when did that develop? It developed, I think, after high school, but it was during my high school days that I fell in with a group of other girls who were very similar in questioning things and enjoying debate, and we used to truly enjoy talking about things that had happened and things that we were told during the day and questioning those things. And, it, it amounted to debating, actually. And then I got into the formal debate team. And um, when I had my friends over to my home, my mother listened in and um, later suggested to me that I might want to consider going to law school. That was really the first time I had thought of it because during those days, women didn't go to law school. It was just unheard of, really. And um, so I didn't consider it before then. And after that, uh, the idea stayed with me, and eventually I went. So you went to Loyola? Yes. Uh, 1953, is that right? I graduated in 1953. Okay, 1950, okay. Uh, you were the only woman in your class, is that right? I was the only woman to graduate in my class. There was a woman with me when we started law school in first year, but she failed. And then there was a different woman with um, me in second year, but she also failed. So by the time of graduation, I was the only woman in the class. What was the experience like in law school for you as really one of the few, if, and sometimes only female? Oh, my classmates were very, very welcoming. I enjoyed them. I loved them, and I'm still good friends with them. In fact, one of them, more than 40 or 50 years later, was co-chairman of my campaign for election to the Supreme Court. But they were very um, respectful of um, my opinions and what I thought. They were, um, they didn't treat me any differently, except, of course, that there was no swearing or no dirty jokes or anything like that. Um, you were also, were you twice elected class president? Yes, which was unusual in that I was the only woman uh, in my last year. Uh, yes, I, I enjoyed it. And uh, uh, my classmates thought I would make a good president, and that's uh, that, must have, that must have been a great feeling at the time. Right? It was, especially since there weren't too many other women around. You know, even in the hallways there weren't women. Um, it, it was an interesting experience. 
Well, it must have been something that, well, every, everywhere you went, uh, it, was, it was obvious that you were, you were the only one of your kind there. At that time. Yeah. See that, I graduated in 1953. The phenomena with women in the professions, not only the legal profession, but all of them, medical school, dental school, architecture, all of those schools, that all occurred in the 70s. So I was 17 years ahead of time, which is um, why there were so few at that time. But in the 70s is, was when the influx of women came in to the schools as well as the professions. What, uh, what area of the law were you most interested in in law school? In law school? Mm -hmm. um, I always thought I would like to be a litigator, but I had never thought of it in terms of criminal law. And that's really where I got my start in the criminal law. And that was in the Cook County State's Attorney's Office, right? Yes. What, uh, what areas did you handle? Every imaginable kind of crime from murder, robbery, rape, burglary, embezzlement, um, just about every crime, all the major felony crimes. I, uh, I tried them all on a daily basis before judges or juries, both of them was a great experience for me. How were you accepted in the Cook County State's Attorney's Office? You would have been one of the few women there at the time, right? Pretty much the same way as I was in law school. I think I'm not, I never was, and was not then, confrontational. I, I tried to achieve whatever I did by uh, collaboration, and I think that may have assisted in my being accepted by my colleagues, wherever they were. Did, did, did you think about at that time when you were trying criminal cases, did you think that you'd like to be on the other side of the bench as a judge? We all think about it, but it, in, in, in a way, you kind of realize that, that at that time was the impossible dream. As a matter of fact, when I was elected to the Supreme Court, a reporter asked me the same question, had I ever thought of it? And I said, no, at that time it was the impossible dream, and now, um, Never again does anybody have to say it's impossible. And, and I, I'm happy for those who follow me, really. Well, we'll talk more about that as well. Um, how do you think that your experience in the uh, prosecutor's office gave you a good grounding for your later career on the bench? Oh, it was excellent experience. You know, when you're trying cases on a daily basis before juries and judges, you are or should be familiar with the rules of evidence. You should know how to put witnesses on. You should know how to cross-examine. You should know how to make closing arguments. Uh, it, it's a, a great experience, and it, it was helpful to me even, even 30 years later when I was in the, on the Supreme Court when we had cases involving jury selection. I, I was very familiar with what goes on. It, you know, at each time or each phase of a trial. You knew because you'd done it. It was great experience. Yeah. It was invaluable. Uh, I, you were there for a number of years, but then went into private practice and worked for private law firms in the Chicago area. Yes. Uh -huh. What was the decision? To, why, why did you do that? Well, at that time, um, about that time, I got married. And um, I got pregnant with my daughter. And uh, I was in a law firm, and the law firm that I was in uh, was headed by a man whose son worked there. And, and it's kind of hard to get ahead when you've got a son uh, there also. So I thought it was time for me to move on. And then in addition, I was giving birth to my daughter. Now, the story you told, a little, you, you told to the academy uh, back in the spring about uh, preparing the case that was to go, I think, to Springfield? Uh, when, when did that take place? Uh, that took place when I was in the um, state's attorney's office. I had prepared the case. Uh, the man who was the head of the appeals section at that time asked me if I would like to argue a case before the Supreme Court. And I, of course, was thrilled. I was a young lawyer, and uh, it was unheard of. You know, and uh, I just, uh, I was very excited about it. And I prepared for it. I studied the case. I studied the briefs, all the arguments, and the law. And I was really all set. But then he thought, and rightfully so, that we should let the top boss know that I'm going down. 
in case of an automobile accident or something, you know, he, the, the head man might wonder, what am I doing in a car in Springfield rather than in my Cook County office? And it was the proper thing to do anyway. So, you know, we asked him if I could go, and the answer was, oh, no. It was, oh, no, women don't argue cases before the Supreme Court. Mm -hmm. And it was, it, it was shut off very quickly and uh, very decisively. And I could not go. Of course, I was greatly disappointed because I had prepared. Um, but it made me think about not only myself, but about all the other women who were talented and who could have and would have and should have been permitted to argue. And um, it, it was just a, a grossly unfair to not permit us to argue a case simply because we were women. If we were incompetent, I could accept that, but not simply because we were women. And uh, so I was, uh, I was upset about it. You do nothing, you live with it, but uh, you, you're very watchful. Did, did you ever feel, and I, I know that you would, you would go to it, for any case you were going to, you would go fully prepared, but would you always, would you ever have a, a sense that you had to be even better prepared than your male yes. colleagues? Yes, yes, because I knew I was being watched. And there are some, unfortunately, who are waiting for you to fail. And uh, I had to make sure that that didn't happen. Um, now, you were elected to the Cook County Circuit Court in 1976? Yes. Right. Okay. And uh, you handled a lot of, uh, I believe, family court law, and then the law jury division, personal injury, malpractice, product liability? Yes. You covered a wide, quite, a bit of, yes. quite a bit of ground there. Tell me about that. Yes. Well, some of the cases involved areas that I had never practiced in, so they were interesting. I was learning new areas of the law and um, had excellent lawyers appear before the court who argued well, who were well prepared, who I, from whom I learned a great deal. And I enjoyed every day. Actually, I've enjoyed every minute of my entire career. Uh, when, when, people see, when people see lawyers and judges at work on television and a lot of the dramatic portrayals, they don't have any sense of the, all the background work and the study that goes into a case, do they? No, and television presents, uh, as I mentioned in a speech just earlier last week, uh, Judge Judy tries two cases usually in one 30-minute segment, and the public, the viewers, get the impression that this is the way it is, when it is not that way. And I think they're very surprised to see that cases don't get tried in 15 minutes. They go on for days or weeks. So it's a big shock to the public. But it, I, get the, I get the sense from you that you find, you find the study of law and the argument in, very intellectually stimulating. Um, the study of law should prepare you to know where to look for the law and how to utilize it. There's no way you can learn all the law. And they cannot teach all of that to you. But it should prepare you to know where to look for the law, where the statutes are, and how to utilize it, how to apply it. And that's mostly what courts of review do. We study the law and apply it. You were first appointed to the appellate court in 1985, and yes. then later elected, uh, I believe, in what, uh, to the Supreme Court in 92. During that time, you saw, you started to see from the 70s and 80s on more, more young women and more women coming into the court. Oh, yes. The women who were arguing cases increased tremendously. By the time I was on the Supreme Court, there were many women arguing cases. There were a couple of times when there were more women than men arguing cases. And of course, I remembered my experience and, and saw how far we progressed, and it was a, it was a joy to see them there. Over, over, the, over your career, you've seen more and more women come in. No one even blinks now when they see a woman walk into the courtroom. Uh, how have they, ch have they changed the way the law is, is done, or ha what have they brought to the, to the court system, to the judicial system? The law is the same for men and for women, as it should be. But the women bring in a, a different perspective to a case that they're arguing that the men do. Not always. Sometimes they're identical. If you couldn't see their faces, you wouldn't know. 
they were men or women. But there are times, and uh, particularly in uh, domestic relations issues, where a woman would bring a different perspective uh, to the law. Or, uh, but again, the law is the same for both men and women. You were obviously recognized for uh, your judicial temperament, for uh, your expertise, and you were, you were elected to the Supreme Court. Uh, the first woman and the only woman in, since, in 173 years, is that right? Yes. What was that feeling like? Glorious, wonderful, magnificent, joyous, relief, uh, everything, all of them, but mostly gratitude, mostly appreciation that I did get elected and that if I did well, women could follow, and they did. And your colleagues on the bench, uh, on the Supreme Court, uh, saw fit to elect you as Chief Justice, another first. Yes. Well, I thought it was interesting that I got elected Chief Justice, uh, the very court before which I was not permitted to argue. Uh, it, it was interesting. But my colleagues on the court, as, as up till that time, were always welcoming. They uh, respected my opinions. They, uh, they were very um, uh, open to me in every way. I know that you have to be impartial as a judge, but is it, is it fair to say that the court under, let's say, the court may take on some of the personality of the person who is Chief Justice? I mean, we, we watched that at the U.S. Supreme Court. Is it fair to ask a question like that? To some extent, yes. The Chief Justice controls the agenda of the court and can bring to the court issues that he or she thinks are important that should be addressed by the court, that should be changed. Um, so, in answer to your question, yes, he or she does bring uh, something to the court. He or she makes appointments to different committees, um, which are a tremendous help to the court. We need them. Um, new, new projects, new ideas usually emanate from the Chief Justice. What were some of the new ideas that, that you brought to the Supreme Court of Illinois? One of the, which I always thought was very important, was to change the law with respect to um, whether or not a lawyer uh, can sell or bestow or bequeath to a surviving spouse. This law practice, if he or she died, it was unfortunate that the surviving spouse got nothing from what was left. And I thought that was a great injustice. So we did get that law changed. Um, we did uh, change the law with respect to what we call mandatory continuing legal education, uh, which is still uh, being you know, respected now. And um, there were a few other uh, things. Uh, one of the things I read about was that you were, um, uh, you were concerned about the backlog of cases in the court system and uh, tried to get people to think more in terms of alternative dispute resolution. Yes. Yes. And that's been working out. I've been seeing some of that in Jackson County where I live. Yes. Well, there are strict rules of um, law with respect to when continuances should be granted. But lots of judges don't adhere to them because they, they're sympathetic to a lawyer asking for a continuance for whatever reason. Some are very valid reasons. Some are uh, avoidable and not necessary. Uh, so we, we ask the judges to more carefully scrutinize the reasons why a um, continuance is being requested and give a continuance only uh, in accordance with the law. I'm wondering too about your influence on younger lawyers and other, other women in public life. Now, one of my other jobs is I cover politics in Springfield and occasionally I'd see you at uh, at dinner with other members of the General Assembly and other lawyers, and it looked like there was a, a great mentoring session going on there. Well, I think it's important, or it's certainly helpful if we work together. So much more can be accomplished when we work together than when we're fighting each other. We each have our duties. You know, we are a check on the legislature, and we are a check on the governor. Um, but our duties are circumscribed too. But it, it, it's much better if we can get along. What about your, your work, uh, your work uh, mentoring young women in the legal profession and, and in public life? 
I've seen you talking to a number of them over the years, and they were, they were hanging on your every word is what it looked like. Well, I, I think it was important that the Supreme Court get what I would call a face. Most people don't know what the Supreme Court does. They don't know what kind of cases it hears. It doesn't know anything about its administrative duties or the fact that that court is responsible for all of the courts throughout the state. That court is responsible for the admission or, um, uh, of attorneys to the bar or censuring attorneys who, who are um, acting improperly. Its administrative duties are, I think, about 50% of its work equal to the time we spend deciding cases. Public isn't aware of that. I don't think the public is also aware of what we not only do on a day-to-day -day basis, but our relationship to the other branches of government. So I tried to put a face on the court, and that's what happened. <clears throat> you still do quite a bit of public speaking? Do you still go out and do uh, public speaking now, uh, still meeting with young lawyers? And are you engaged in any, do you do any teaching now? Well, I'm doing mostly public speaking. I delivered the Corboy lecture, and I have lectured uh, and taught a course uh, uh, in addition, but I haven't done too much, really. Uh, the school, the law school, is very gracious and permits me to do pretty much what I want. I also signed a contract to do mediation and arbitration work, but I, I only attended a seminar in relation to that job, that contract. I haven't done any cases. As you look back on your career, what, what's given you the most satisfaction over what you've been able to accomplish uh, uh, for yourself personally and for, for women in the profession? I think that I get the most satisfaction from seeing the doors open to everybody, women, people of color, um, different groups, just an opening to everybody's welcome if you, if you can perform, if you're competent. And that's extremely important, that you be competent. But if you are competent, I don't think you should be eliminated from, considering, from consideration for any job, be it assistant state's attorney or public defender or counsel or judge or whatever. I just think that if you are competent, you should be given an equal opportunity. And I, that gives me the most satisfaction to see that that's pretty much true now or becoming true. You strike me as, as something of a, of, of a modest person, but can I ask you about what you think your legacy has been to uh, the Supreme Court in Illinois? What mine would be? Yeah. Obviously. Um, the opening the doors for women. I don't want to emphasize that because I did represent men as much as I did women. But uh, it was there that the court needed rectifying. And it was there that I was able to change things. I was able to put women on com Supreme Court committees where before I got there, very, very few women were on Supreme Court committees. Um, there were a lot of doors that were open and uh, I always made sure that whomever I appointed, be it to a judgeship or a committee, that that person knew that I expected the highest standard of performance from her or him, both. And, uh, for example, I, I have had Jewish lawyers come to me and ask me to appoint them to the bench because they can't get elected simply because of their strongly um, strong Jewish names. It's very, very unfair, really. And that still continues till this day. I did appoint quite a few, uh, simply because I thought that to be out of consideration because of their heritage was really not fair. It's not America, certainly. <clears throat> That's interesting. I didn't know that that was so much of a problem, really. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I did not know that that was such a problem. Oh, it is. Yeah. Oh, it is, and that's true of some other nationalities, too. Mm. But that one came to mind in response to your question. Mm. And I remember this lawyer saying, if you don't appoint me, there's no way I can become a judge. Mm. Our I, I appointments know. are all temporary, though, you know, mm -hmm. until the next general election. Mm -hmm. And at that point, they stand for retention. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Well, we were, asked, we were kind of batting that around this morning, trying to figure out the, the system on it. Um, I think I've got pretty much all the questions answered that uh, I came with. Okay. So I think we're in good shape. Is there anything that 
I didn't touch upon that you would like to uh, get on the record, so to speak? No, I just hope that the time would come when people look up at the judge and not notice if, if it's a he or a she or a black or a white or a pink or green or what or what, that we just view that person as a judge, irrespective of those other things. We don't, it's not important. Well, you've helped make that come about. I, I hope so. <laughs> Thank you so much. Thank I you. Think this went very well. Thank you. We'll Let sure. me show you the pictures okay. and you decide what you want.